All right, I think we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome any, everybody to uh, another uh, Nanoet Tech Seminar here at Georgia Tech. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, just a word about our next meeting, which will be two weeks from today on uh, February 22nd. Uh, and the speaker will be Professor Lauren Garten from the School of Material Science and Engineering. And we will be meeting in the Pettit Building, the microelectronics research building uh, just down the street, not in this building, in two weeks. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Martin Morgal from the School of Physics here at Georgia Tech. Uh, Martin got his uh, bachelor's degree in materials at the Ecole de Mines de Nancy in France. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, and then his master's and uh, PhD degrees in physics at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale, the EPFL in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he then did a postdoctoral uh, uh, stint at Johns Hopkins before coming to Georgia Tech in 2015, where he's currently an associate professor of physics. Um, he's had won a number of awards, most uh, notably uh, 2018 NSF Career Award and a 2019 Kavli Fellow from the National Academy of Sciences. And with that, I will turn it over to Martin. All right, thank you, David. Uh, thanks to IEN for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to give a talk in person uh, to, to all of you. Um, so this is going to be um, an introduction to some of the ideas we, uh, we explore in my lab and in other labs at Georgia Tech with whom we collaborate. And um, so my interest is in magnetism. And um, we prefix it with the word quantum magnetism to, uh, to express the idea that uh, at low temperature in this magnet, there is genuinely quantum phenomena that we can observe and try to understand. So I came in 2015. Uh, this is the group uh, integrated over the years here. Um, and so we were fortunate to have uh, support from the NSF and the Department of Energy, as well as uh, IEN, uh, Georgia Tech College of Science. And um, as you will see, uh, we are using national scale facilities to probe this magnet. So that includes neutron sources at Oak Ridge National Lab and at NIST in, uh, in uh, in Gettysburg, uh, Maryland, and also uh, recently started to use a crystal growth facility that is funded by the NSF, and this is the Cornell Johns Hopkins facility. So the outline of that talk is as follows. I want to uh, talk a little bit about condensed matter and how physicists see materials, uh, which is, may not be the same way as material scientists see materials. Uh, we see this in terms of symmetry and phases. Um, and then I will talk about the concept of spin liquids, uh, where these spin liquids, what they are, and how they emerge in real material then how we uh, characterize and study them, um, which involves this technique of neutron scattering. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about the current trends in the fields and the sort of things we are trying to, to, uh, to, to get at um, in, in research. So uh, you know, the way physicists think about uh, uh, materials is really to classify them according to their symmetries. And the most simple thing you can imagine is you have um, you're going to have a solid and a liquid, and these two phases of, of matter are separated by a phase transition at a given temperature. And in some sense, you can say a liquid uh, does not break any symmetry. A solid breaks certain symmetries that are translational or rotational. And we can classify, essentially, all, uh, all solids using crystallography. And there's you know, a certain number of space groups that we can use, and so on and so forth. Um, and liquids, um, although they don't have broken symmetries, they are still interested, interesting on, the, on their own. And in fact, when you are very close to a transition, a liquid is a highly correlated state of matter. So the positions of the atoms are not random, and they are correlated. And we will see that this is kind of the same idea in what I will call a spin liquid. Okay? And uh, you know, the traditional way that people have been studying liquids and solids is using, for instance, diffraction, where you can shine a beam here of x-rays on a crystal or a powder, and you collect intensity in a detector at a certain angle to theta. And Bragg's law is giving you, OK, well, for a given scattering angle, I can see a, a different momentum transfer. And I can reconstruct from the momentum transfer the spacing between the atoms. And that's how we know the structure of materials um, in, in, in the bulk. Okay? Uh, and, and you have many different ways to, to do this. So one example here, uh, very simple, is just a solid neon. And you see here a Bragg diffraction with the, uh, of solid neon. This is an old PRL paper from the uh, 50s. And you see sharp Bragg peaks that are a characteristic of, of the solid. Okay? But of course, you could warm up that, that system. Uh, here, it's argon and neon are almost ex is essentially the same. So imagine we just warm up this, and we go in the liquid phase, and we see that the diffraction uh, spectrum of this 
or the diffraction pattern of this liquid, uh, keeps some of the characteristics of the solid, in particular they are peaks, but these peaks are broad and diffuse. So liquids um, uh, keep some organization that, that in, in informs on the way they're gonna crystallize, and uh, uh, these oscillations here in the structure factor are a signature of the correlations between the atoms. So in my research, we essentially do the same, except we use um, uh, magnetic materials that are liquid in the sense that their spins are not ordered. And instead of using x-rays, we use neutrons to characterize uh, such correlations in, in matter, okay? Of course, you can also do this on, on crystals, and these are some nice, you know, uh, 1912 measurements, and this is nowadays measurement on some crystals, so there's been a lot of progress in x-ray diffraction. But um, one thing that you may not, not be aware of is that there are certain materials that do not fall into this classification of solids and, and, and liquid. And one example that physicists like to talk about is, is liquid helium. So when you cool liquid helium to low temperatures, it actually does not freeze. And um, at some uh, temperature of the order of uh, uh, two Kelvin here, you have a phase transition between two phases of the liquid. And this phase transition characterizes the emergence of a macroscopic quantum phenomena that we call superfluidity. So when the system does not freeze, it tends at low temperature to stabilize some quantum state that has you know, special properties, in that case, superfluid, okay? So that's one example of, uh, uh, we would say, a quantum material, so a quantum liquid, because at low temperature, in absence of freezing, the system behaves according to the laws of quantum mechanics. There are other materials that are interesting to physicists and material scientists, such as liquid crystals, and they are a hybrid between solids and, 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 and liquids in the sense that they break only certain symmetries, and um, you know, a lot of phenomena can emerge from liquid crystals as well. But here, you know, what I want to talk about today is this idea of spin liquid, and if you type spin liquid in Google, you're gonna get this nice illustration from um, a colleague in the UK, um, and uh, the first thing, uh, you may want to think about is that spin liquids are liquid-like phases of magnetic matter, okay? But this picture is wrong, okay? This is not what a spin liquid is. This is not a liquid of spins in that sense. And what's missing from this picture is that these spin liquids, the reason we are interested in them is that they are dominated at the atomic scale by quantum entanglement, which of course this picture does not capture. And in the same way that superfluid helium at low temperature is dominated by a macroscopic quantum phenomena that is superfluidity. Okay? So that's the picture. Uh, let's try to look at these spin liquids. Okay? So where to find them? What are they? That's the first thing I want to uh, try to explain a little bit. Okay? And we will navigate between the concept of what is called a MOT insulator to deriving what is called the Heisenberg model, which is essentially the thing that describes all spin liquids and quantum magnets in general, okay? So um, you may have heard about the word quantum matter, and this is um, what uh, the, the catchphrase that physicists use to describe a material that is interesting to them. Um, and there are many such quantum materials that do many, many different things. So for instance, the quantum hole effect, you have a 2D electron gas in high magnetic field, this is, a quantum, this is an example of quantum matter. Uh, you can imagine topological insulators, topological materials, inconventional superconductors, or disordered metals. All of these phases are dominated by quantum effects. But one thing that is special about them is that they all have conduction or itinerant electrons, okay? In my research on spin liquids, we work with insulators, so the materials do not conduct electricity. And in fact, this is because they do not conduct electricity that a special spin phenomena emerges in the material, and that's what I want to um, explain a little bit. So we will not talk about materials dominated by electronic conduction in this talk. We will talk about insulators. And by the way, this is one of the challenge with spin liquids to use them in applications is that they are not, in, they are not conducting. So how do we functionalize them? or do we integrate them in devices? So that's something we don't actually know what to do at this point. So let me, um, let me explain and highlight the way physicists think, think about materials, which is, in some sense, you know, from a crystal structure that you may have determined with X-ray diffraction to a model that does weird stuff, okay? So let's talk about this. And as an example, I'm taking a very famous material, which is lanthanum copper oxide. It's a perovskite material where you have octahedrals of copper surrounded by oxygen and some stacking of these octahedrals in, in the system. Um, 
And the first thing you may want to think about is, so this material is magnetic, and you might ask, where is the magnetism coming from? Well, the magnetism is coming from the local physics of the copper 2 plus ion. So you have nine electrons to put into the d orbital, and these d orbitals are not degenerate because they are surrounded by oxygen charges, so there is something we call a crystal field. And when you populate all these orbitals with electrons, you end up with one orbital with one electron. And all these orbitals here are filled. So what the physicists do, they truncate this Hilbert space, they discard the physics coming from this field orbital, and they consider Cockpit 2 plus a simple one spin half in one orbital. So that's already a dramatic reduction of the complexity of, this, of the system from a full crystal structure to one electron in one orbital. Okay? And if you remember your atomic physics or your chemistry, you remember that this particular orbital is a, is a square planar orbital. And so it means that the spin half moment that lives here in the 3D shell actually lives kind of in the plane. And so what really matters in lanthanum copper oxide is just the plane of copper oxygen. This is where the magnetic physics is taking place. Okay? Um, and we have a way to describe, uh, the physicists have a way to describe the physics using the so-called Hubbard model. So you probably heard about this before, but let, let's just revisit or discuss what the Hubbard model is telling us. Okay? So what the Hubbard model starts from is to say, well, you know, at every side on this crystal, we have one electron in one orbital. So I'm going to draw the system like this, and then I'm going to remove the crystal. I'm just going to talk about my orbitals with one electron. That's the, the next step in the modeling of this system. And then you might, you know, just count your electrons and say, well, this is great. You know, I can probably take one electron, and there is one electron, one hole per site. So I can probably propagate my electron in the system. And this system should definitely be a metal. There is the, the, the possibility for the electrons to move around because there are some empty spots for which, where, where they can go. And the first thing you might do is you take two electrons with the same spin and you put them in some orbital and you, know, you have a big red flag from quantum mechanics that is Pauli exclusion principle. This cannot happen. Um, so then you might say, okay, well, I'm going to do something more interesting. I'm going to take spins of different directions on sites that are ne ne next to each other. And I can take one electron, I can make it hop here, 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 and you can propagate that electron through the lattice. And you pay uh, some kinetic energy, we call it T. Um, the font is a little bit weird here, this is a T. So the kinetic, you gain some kinetic energy by moving the electron like this. So if you believe band structure, this material should be you know, a, a good metal and uh, you can make it in the lab and you're gonna get something that looks like a ceramic, okay? So definitely not a metal, not shiny. So, so it's already apparent when you synthesize the system, okay? So why is it not a, a metal? And the reason it's not a metal is that when we do this picture, we forget that electrons interact with each other. And it turns out when you put two electrons on the same site with opposite spins, you have to pay a huge cost in energy which comes from the electrostatics of the electron-electron interaction. We call this the Coulomb U. This is the uh, inter-electron uh, uh, energy, okay? And so uh, what happens in this type of system is that the Coulomb repulsion is much greater than the kinetic energy. And as a result, although the electrons attempt to hop from one side to the other, effectively, they cannot do that because the, the cost in energy is too high. So this, what we call virtual processes, so the electrons sample their neighboring sites, but they are not able to propagate as a conduction electron, okay? So, um, so as a result of this, there is a localization of the electrons on the lattice sites. But because of Pauli exclusion principle, you see that two neighboring sites have opposite spin. Okay? So that's the emergence of what we call a non-tiferomagnetic insulator out of a system with one electron per unit cell that should otherwise be a conductor. Okay? And so then I can uh, you know, bring back my crystal, I repopulate with my crystal, and I put some spins, and I have a non-tiferomagnet. Okay? So lanthanum copper oxide, because of strong correlations between electrons, is a non-tiferomagnetic insulator. Okay? So now, what do we have to do to understand this material? Well, we are left with one spin per site, and now we can start to understand how the spins interact with each other and how their excitations may behave in the system. And it turns out that the spin excitations are the lowest energy excitation in the system. This is what happens at low temperature in, in, in this system. Okay? And in particular, there is long-range magnetic order. So out of all of this complicated technology or theoretical uh, technology, emerges a very simple model that was actually invented before we knew about the Hubbard model, which is called the Heisenberg model. 
And the Heisenberg model is a, a, a simple model that says that if you have two spins that are nearest neighbor on the lattice, there is a certain cost in energy associated with their dot product. We call this the exchange interaction. It turns out the exchange interaction can be derived as a function of the Hubbard parameters, T and U. It's T squared over U. And uh, for reasons I don't have time to explain, but that involve the ligands that participate also in this, in this phenomena, uh, this exchange interaction can be negative, and if you minimize the energy, you're going to get two spins aligned, or it can be positive, and you have anti-ferromagnetic interactions. So the, the Heisenberg model um, is a very simple model of magnetism that can be uh, you know, derived from first principles, if you wish, from a larger electronic system that is here, lanthanum, as an example, lanthanum copper oxide. So this model was formulated in 1935, I believe, and we are still working on it every day in my lab, in many other <laughs> labs in the world. People are trying to understand the Heisenberg model, okay, in all its different variations, okay? So if you have a good model, then, you know, you can study it until you retire, okay? Do not ever solve it, okay? If you have a good model, do not solve it. Continue to, uh, to try to understand it. Okay, good. So that's what we're going to focus on. And I, I'm going to, to explain a bit this idea of quantum magnetism, I'm going to work with a very simple system. Now, I'm going to remove lanthanum copper oxide from your head. Imagine you have two spins. And they are coupled with exchange interactions. And I want to know the ground state of that stuff. What can be the ground state? Well, you can go to an undergrad quantum mechanics textbook, and uh, you will learn that uh, you need to describe this using so-called Hilbert space. And the dimension of that Hilbert space will grow as 2 to the n, where n is the number of spins. And here we have two spins, so we have a 4 by 4 matrix to diagonalize. And this is Georgia Tech. We, we can do that, OK? Although sometimes we get surprises um, when we assign such uh, exams in quantum mechanics 1. Um, but anyway, so you can diagonalize this problem. And what you find is that uh, although classically, you know, classically you would say if I have an antiferromagnet, well, I'm going to put one spin up and one spin down. That's my ground state. But it turns out that quantum mechanically, this, uh, this breaks rotation symmetry, so this is not a good ground state. And a good ground state is actually a quantum superposition of spin up and down and dub, uh, down and up. And you have a singlet state, which corresponds to the quantum superposition of these two up, down, and down, up states. So that's what the ground state of a, a dimer of two spins is. And then you have an excited state that is separated by a gap of the order of the exchange interaction. And that excited state is a triplet state. So you have two spins up, two spins down, and the, quantum, uh, the symmetric superposition of these two things. Okay? So that's undergraduate quantum mechanics. Two spins interacting antiferromagnetically, the ground state is not magnetic because it's a quantum superposition of up, down, and down, up. Okay? So now, of course, uh, we can actually prepare materials that have this kind of dimer structures, and this, this have been studies in the 90s uh, quite a lot. But it's more interesting to consider you now an extended system, like you would get in a real crystal. For instance, a chain of spin halves interacting antiferromagnetically. And um, it turns out this problem can be solved exactly or can be solved approximately with very advanced numerical techniques. Uh, we have some specialists at Georgia Tech, in particular, doing tensor network techniques. Uh, but we know the, the ground state exactly, but it's, it's, it's not useful for uh, presentation at that level. So what I will do is just use my knowledge of the, the two spins uh, uh, problem and say, well, you know what? I'm going to just take my chain and I'm going to divide it in even and odd uh, pairs, and I'm going to put some singlets. Okay, so I can rather construct a ground state where I pair these two spins, pair these two spins, or if I want, I could do it on the other type of sides. Okay? And the question is which it is. Okay? Which ground state is this? And um, this ground state actually breaks translation symmetry because it picked some of the, the it, it selected some of the bonds, although this, these bonds are equivalent. So what the ground state actually is, is the superposition of these two possibilities in, in very, very simple terms, okay? And what happens in a spin chain like this is the ground state of this thing is what we call a macroscopic singlet. So instead of entangling two spins two by two, you entangle all the spins with each other in something that we call the quantum spin liquid. It does not break any symmetry. In particular, there is no, there is no direction for the spins. Wherever you are in that chain, you cannot tell where you are, so there is translation symmetry. So this is a liquid. It does not break any symmetry. But it's a highly entangled state of matter. There are correlations between the spins, and these correlations are very important. 
If you look at the system closely, you would realize that at short distances, the spins are actually almost anti-ferromagnetic anti-ferromagnetically correlated. So locally, it kind of looks like this, but at long distance, it's disordered like in a liquid. So that's one example of what we call a quantum spin liquid. And we know it exactly because we can solve it exactly. OK? Um, one of the interesting aspects of this quantum spin liquid, now I, I'm removing this entangled picture, which is the right picture, and I'm going to the local physics, which is anti-ferromagnetic at local scales. And I'm, I'm plotting this system like this. And then I'm asking, what are the excitations? Okay. So physicists love to study systems through their excitations. So what is the excitation of the system? Well, you have one spin here. And what can you do? Well, you can flip it. Okay. So that's an elementary excitation of a magnetic system. And it turns out, in this entangled ground state, when you flip one spin, you see you're creating two domain walls or defects. And you can take these two domain walls, and you can separate them independently, they behave independently in the system. And um, this is an example of something we call fractionalization. So I created an excitation that has s equal 1, because I started from a spin plus minus half, and I bring it to spin minus 1 half. So I have a delta s equal 1 excitation. But I fractionalize this excitation into two subparticles that have spin half. Okay? So um, if you go in the theory of this, you realize that these excitations, we call them spin-ons, they are fermionic, they behave like fermions. Although the initial excitation was a spin-1, so it behaved like a boson. So this is an example of what we call fractionalization. And so the beauty of all of this, and the message here, is that we have a way to know if a system is quantum entangled. It is quantum entangled if it exhibits fractional excitations. OK, so that's the, that's the message from this. And now the question is, can I measure these fractional excitations? Before I do this, let me just give you an example of something more simple that you may be more used to. And that's the ferromagnet. So let's consider a ferromagnet. All the spins are aligned. And I excite it. I also flip a spin. But now, my flip spin propagates just as a coherent particle. It does not fractionalize into the main walls. Why? Because if I separate these two uh, orange bars here, you would you get two spins down, three spins down. So that costs you more energy. So this does not happen. So in a ferromagnet, the excitations are just this stuff propagating. And this is what we call a spin wave. This is a Fourier transform of a, a flip spin. OK? Good. So now, how do we, you know, so again, the message is that we, have, we cannot tell for sure if a system is quantum entangled, but what we can do is measure its excitations. And from the understanding of the excitations, are they fractional, like here, or are they integer, like here? We can tell if the system is entangled. So that's what we're going to do now. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we characterize spin liquids? And my technique involves something called neutron scattering. So you know, treat fire with fire, treat spins with spins. That's the idea here. So one of the beauty was, so neutron scattering in many regards resembles X-ray diffraction. So you prepare a beam of particles, which are also waves by quantum mechanics, and you shine them on your sample. But the beauty is that the neutron itself has a spin half degree of freedom. So through the spin of the neutron that can interact with the spin of the sample, we can understand what the spins are doing in the system. Okay? So a scattering experiment is, is simple. You prepare, a well, you prepare a beam of particles. They have a well-defined momentum, well-defined energy, well-defined spin, or as good as your instrument can prepare such things. You scatter it on the sample, and then the, uh, the neutron will be deflected. It will deposit momentum, energy, and spin in the sample. And then you can measure the resulting pattern of diffraction from, from, from the neutron beam. So we can formalize this, and we can uh, try to understand a little bit the theory of neutron scattering without going in details, which are not necessary for this talk. What we measure in the detector, the cross-section, is proportional up to some terms that are just geometric in nature to something we call the dynamic structure factor, S of Q and omega. And you may wonder, what is S of Q and omega? Well, this is that quantity here. This is the Fourier transform in time and space of correlations between spins. So imagine you have the movie of what all the spins are doing. Well, you Fourier transform it in time and space, and that's what we get through neutron scattering. So my job and my students' job is to disentangle this Fourier transform to understand what the spins are doing in real space and real time in very simple terms. Okay? 
Um, so, you know, the theory is well established and, and all of this works great. So let me give you an example of how a neutron scattering instrument looks like. Um, so this is just a schematic here of an instrument at Oak Ridge National Lab. And um, this is what looks the most like an X-ray diffractometer. So you have uh, a neutron source, which is a nuclear reactor. Um, and then we prepare a beam of uh, monochromatic, we, pre we have a beam of neutron that comes. Here's the monochromator, so it prepares a well-defined wavelength. Uh, these neutrons impinge on the sample. Our sample scatters the neutron and are deflected at many different angles. They may lose or gain energy, so they have a different wavelength. So here in, in this bank here, we have analyzers, like in a Raman spectrometer, for instance. And we can measure as a function of the scattering angle and the energy loss, the scattering. So this is one type of instrument. This type of instrument is not very efficient because we, uh, out of all the neutrons that are scattered by the sample, we only detect a small, uh, uh, a small solid angle, if you wish. So the new generation of instruments that, that we are using uh, rely on something called the time of flight technique. So, um, uh, so what we're trying to do is to remove the analyzers. Um, and in order to remove the analyzers and still know the energy of the neutrons, we rely on the time of flight. So the beam of neutron, in, instead of being uh, continuous, it's pulsed, so it's coming at a certain frequency, which is 60 hertz, um, impinges on the sample, and then the sample will scatter the neutrons in a large area detector, which is of the order of five meter by five meter, uh, you know, millions of pixels, okay? So like this, um, we can measure, uh, in some way, it's a parallelized detection system, okay? And um, because we do time of flight, we can simply measure as a function of time to reconstruct the energy of the neutrons that are impinging on the, on the on the detector. So this is a very efficient way to do neutron scattering. Okay? So time of flight, uh, time of flight uh, neutron scattering. Okay, so first, uh, finally some data that I took during my PhD on a very simple system. So this is copper sulfate. Um, copper sulfate is um, in some approximation at very low temperature, 100 millikelvin. It's a spin chain, okay? And what we do here is we measure the excitations of that spin chain. Remember that I told you they should be fractional. I measure them as a function of momentum transfer, so uh, uh, the, the, the scattering angle along the chains, and energy, and you see the energy is very small, below one MeV. And what I see is this, the color here encodes the scattering. So if it's red, it's very intense. If it's blue, there is no scattering, and so on and so forth. And what you see is something that looks like a sine wave here, but there is a continuum of excitations that lives above this thing. And this continuum of excitation is the signature of fractional excitations. So this experiment proved that this material at low temperature um, has fractional excitations and as a proxy has an entangled ground state. But to be sure that this is the case, we did something that was very useful in this material. We apply a magnetic field and because the interactions are so weak in the system, with a five Tesla magnetic field, you can tr completely transform the system from a non-ferromagnet to a ferromagnet. And I told you in a ferromagnet, I don't have entanglement, I don't have fractional excitation, I just have spin waves. And indeed, you see how the spectrum is completely transformed when I apply the magnetic field. And now you see that for one value of wave vector, I have one energy. This is exactly a spin wave, or a it's the band structure of the magnet, if you wish, okay? So this experiment proved that you can tune from a quantum entangled ground state to product state, a classical state, by using the magnetic field. And so this type of experiments, um, after, so I was not the first to do this, but I was the first to do in a single material the, the change of magnetic field like this. And so um, uh, this experiment has become, what, what people are looking for is the fractional excitation. They are looking for this continuum of excitations in materials to prove that they are entangled. Okay, um, so, so the picture that you should remember is a magnetic excitation, traditional magnetic excitation is just a spin flip. It corresponds to all the spin processing and it leads to, you know, bands like this in the scattering and fractional excitations like spin ons, they correspond to continuum. Good, so just to convince you, here's another example uh, that I worked on as a student. It's not a chain now, but it's a square lattice, a square lattice antiferromagnet. It has this kind of Neal state. And if you measure the magnetic excitations in the first brilliant zone as a function of momentum and energy, what you see is a well-defined, nicely defined branches. So it's a nice dispersion curve. This system is not entangled. 
there's just spin wave excitations and it behaves as we expect. So something is very special in that material and that's the 1D, the fact that it's one dimensional. Good, so one thing I didn't tell you and that I kind of hid from this is that neutron scattering can be a huge pain for a reason which is that this number here that relates the cross section to the theory or to the, 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 the dynamic structure factor, that number is extremely small. Okay, the neutron scattering cross section is extremely small. So X-rays interact with materials through the electrons, the scattering is strong, but neutrons interact as a dipole-dipole interaction. So the scattering is very, very weak. And our neutron sources comparatively to X-ray scattering sources are also very weak. So, um, so there's no way around it. Rather you make a more intense neutron source or you bring more material to the beam, okay? And here, this is the example of we bring more material to the beam. So these are single crystals of the materials of interest that we grew in different ways. And for instance, the copper sulfate sample I showed you was a 5.5 grams of single crystal. Okay, so that's, uh, as far as I know, the biggest copper sulfate. I mean, you can actually make them very, very, very big. Even high school students can do this. But it's actually d uh, heavy water crystal because hydrogen absorbs neutrons. So anyway, these are examples of materials we've been working on in the lab. And one example here, uh, recently a student of mine, Zhao um worked on, on making samples of a simple material, FeI2, and he went from doing CVT growth in the lab that yield, you know, milligram type samples to a five gram Bridgman grown single crystal that we grew at Johns Hopkins. And so in my lab, we are always concerned about making our samples bigger, okay? So that's, and that's because the neutrons interact so weakly with the system. Okay, so that's one way, uh, and, and that's a picture of the thing. So of course we interact with IEN and the MCF to characterize our materials, and we have things that look like chemistry in the lab to, to make these systems, right? Um, so the other way is to increase the neutron flux, okay? And so depending on how much money you have, you can do this, which is gonna cost you in the 50K per sample, all the time investment of people, or you make your neutron source more intense, and that's gonna be a billion dollar investment. And that type of investment is, is ongoing at the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Lab. So um, some of the data I showed you was measured on the spoliation source at Oak Ridge that opened in, in 2007. So let me just explain how this works very briefly. We take some protons, we accelerate them close to the speed of light, we bunch them together, and at a frequency of 60 hertz, we smash them in a bucket of liquid mercury. When that bucket of liquid mercury gets excited, neutrons are emitted from the mercury in a pulse fashion, and then we channel these this, uh, neutrons to different beam lines, okay? So that's been working uh, uh, pretty well. But now we are involved in a project that we call the second target station, and um, what we will do is one proton out of six will be deflected to a new building with a new source and a new set of, you know, 20 instruments or something like this. So, um, the, the, the thing that is amazing about this project of new neutron source is that, so when the neutrons are produced here, they have a lot of energy and we need to moderate them. So like in a nuclear reactor, we need to move their energy from the MeV with a big M to MeV with a small M. And there's been a lot of advances in designing moderators that allow us to keep the flux of neutrons. And it is projected that at the second target station, the flux of cold neutrons, so five angstrom, wavelengths, the neutrons that I care for my type of problems, low energy magnetic problems, this flux combined with the instruments being better might be as much as a factor 100. So now, instead of bring, bring, bringing one gram crystal, I may be able to bring 10 milligram crystal. And if you know the difference between one gram crystal and 10 milligram crystal, it's the day and night in terms of synthesis. So we believe that with the new neutron source, we'll be able to look at samples as they arrive on the on the market, you know. So some of these crystals, you know, it took us years to, in particular this one took years to grow, and so by the time we did the experiment, nobody cared at that, at that point, you know. It's not entirely true, but, okay. And so another thing we can do, just very briefly, um, so because, so that source is at 60 hertz, so one, uh, you know, one over 60 sec, every one over 60 seconds, there is a new pulse of neutron coming in but that neutron source will be at 10 hertz. So there is much more time between pulses. And so what we will do at this thing is, instead of sending one uh, uh, monochromatic beam of neutrons, we will send several wavelengths. And in the time we have between pulses, we can analyze 
multiple wavelengths. So it has a multispectral component to it. So at the same time, we will increase our flux, but we will measure different wavelengths at the same time. And we believe that's going to be very useful to understand some of the systems. So stay tuned. Uh, 2032, $1.5 billion. Uh, talk to your congressperson. OK, oh, at least, uh, you know. Uh, but the, the, we, we're already planning, we're already designing instruments, and I'm involved in one project called CHESS. Uh, this is an instrument led by Gabriele Sala, which is one of the spectrometer that will be there at, the, at Oak Ridge uh, Spallation, the second target station. Good. So let me finish off with the future and the things we'd like to do, the things we'd like to study if we have this amazing neutron source. So uh, before I do this, um, we're going to go back to our spinchion problem. And we're going to ask a simple question, which is, what if I don't have a spin half degree of freedom, but imagine I have a spin one degree of freedom? I add one electron. So first of all, the material that will produce such a chain cannot be made of copper. Why? Because there is one electron in the orbital of copper. So we need to move to something else, for instance, nickel, where you have two orbitals that have the same energy, and I can put two electrons in this. So I have a spin one system. Okay. So now. Uh, you can just imagine it's the same model as before, except it's made with spin one. And we call this model the Haldane chain. And Haldane got the Nobel Prize for understanding that and other aspects of that system. So let me just show you what's different. So I'm going to do a, a little trick that was invented by Affleck, Leap, Kennedy, and Tasaki, which is to add a non-physical part of this Hamiltonian. But that, don't, don't worry too much about this. What I'm going to do here is, OK, instead of having a spin one, a uh, spin half, I have a spin one. So I'm going to divide my spin one in two spin halves at every side. So you see, every side of that chain, this spin, for instance, has been divided in one spin half here and one spin half here. And I told you, when I have spin halves, what I want to do is create singlets out of them. So here I'm creating singlets between the spin halves. But you see, the beauty of this model is that the singlet involves one half, uh, one half spin from that side and one half spin from this other side. So we are constructing a ground state now that entangles two parts of a spin one from two different sides. And we create a ground state like this that is exactly, it's actually the ground state of the system. It's exact. And um, it has something called topological order. So that's a little bit um, difficult to, to understand but uh, formally. But just imagine that that chain has finite length. Okay, Just imagine it's a finite length system. You see there is one lonely spin half at the end and one lonely spin half at the end that has not been entangled because there's nobody to entangle it with. So this finite length Haldane chain has singlets in the bulk. And to break a singlet, you need to pay an energy, which is J. So the, the, the bulk is gapped. But at the edge of the system, there is a spin half degree of freedom that if I apply a magnetic field, for instance, will it be able to orient in the magnetic field. So the edges of the system are gapless. So this is actually the first example of a topological state of matter where the bulk is gapped and the edges are gapless. And for this, by the way, this was not written down the first time like this. This was written down in terms of field theory. But, but for this and other contributions, Haldane got the Nobel Prize a few, a few years ago uh, for understanding this kind of phenomenon. And now the way we understand this is that this Majorana, this, this dangling spins at the end of the spin chains are actually something we call Majorana fermions. They have a special property. They are their own antiparticle. And because they are their own antiparticle, they can be used for quantum computation. So I will not go into details because I don't actually know much about how we would do this, but they are very exciting from that perspective. But one problem, at least as far as I am concerned, as a scatterer that sees things in reciprocal space, this physics is addressed in local space, in real space. This is a local problem. This is not a global problem in reciprocal space. This is something that happens at the edge. So to fully understand the systems, we need to move to a real space probe. So the first thing you might say is, let's do scanning, tunneling microscope. But the systems are insulating, so you cannot tunnel through them. So one of the emerging techniques is nitrogen vacancy sensing. So you put um, a small qubit on an AFM tip, and you can go and hope to go and scan this. And so that's something I'm, I'm quite excited about uh, for the future. And I'm not doing this, but, but others are, are doing this. OK, so now uh, this is 1D. And uh, you know this is known since the 1980s. And we uh, don't have a quantum computer yet. And, and the reason for this is that 1D is really special. And, and the question is, can this happen in higher dimensions? 
And until recently, we believed it cannot happen in higher dimensions. But uh, emerged an idea from the phys physicist Alexei Kitayev that is revolutionary in many ways because Kitayev found an exact, so, so by the way, this is also an example of, of a form of quantum liquid. Kitayev found an exact quantum liquid in two dimensions. So let me try to explain how this works very briefly. This is the end of the talk, so we can go in the weeds here. Okay? So, uh, so imagine my magnet is not a chain, but imagine it's a honeycomb lattice, and, and we have a lot of, of magnetic systems that can be on the honeycomb lattice. Um, and what uh, Kitayev invented, so it's also a spin half system, but what Kitayev invented is a very special type of, Heise of interaction that is not Heisenberg. So usually if you have two spins, you know, the energy of that bond, for instance, is going to be S dot S. So it's going to be the dot product between two spins. But Kitayev created an Hamiltonian that is seemingly unphysical, where the blue bonds connect only the X component of the spins, the red bond only the Z component, and the green bond only the Y component. So it's some kind of Ising system that is bond dependent. It's a very weird Hamiltonian, okay? And um, it turns out we can realize this Hamiltonian. We can make materials that actually have this property. The, the way to understand this is that we need spin-orbit coupling. We need the spins to know about the lattice. So there needs to be an amount of spin-orbit coupling. So we need to move away from the transition metals that typically have small spin-orbit coupling to, for instance, ruthenium, iridium, or prosodium 4 plus. We have Arun here who works in Lapierre's lab on making prosodium 4 plus systems because of their spin-orbit coupling properties. Okay? And it turns out that if you couple some of these ions in a certain geometry in a crystal, you may end up with this bond-dependent interactions. And we have a few specialists on campus, including a new theorist, Itamar Kimchi, who kind of was at the leading edge of, of understanding the connection between this strange Hamiltonian and materials. And why does this work, and what actually happens? Okay, so this is the revolutionary idea by Kitayev. You take this Hamiltonian, and at each site where you have only a spin half, I'm going to fractionalize my spin half into four types of fermions. Okay, this is some weird ID. So I'm going to fractionalize it in four types of fermions. And you see, for instance, here, so that side has the orange fermion that is at the middle, and a, 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 a red, a green, and a blue. And that blue fermion I'm going to pair with another blue. That green fermion I'm going to pair with another green. So I'm going to create these singlets, okay, in the system, and I'm kind of going to remove them, and I'm left with at each side one fermion here that lives on that thing. And it turns out these fermions are also Majorana fermions. They are their own antiparticles. And we can actually propagate them and move them, move them in the crystal. So, uh, so let me rewind here a little bit. By doing this kind of, okay, this is a cartoon of what was done with field theory techniques, okay? But um, Kitayev found an exactly solvable quantum spin liquid for this Hamiltonian. Which, which was completely unexpected. In physics, usually, we don't have exactly solvable problems. This is an exactly solvable thing. So it's telling you quantum spin liquids exist. We can prove it, okay? Now, do they, are they realized in material is another story, okay? But, um, so we use this thing, and then you realize, oh, you are left with some fermions are, are localized and some fermions are itinerant. And we can use these fermions, in principle, to do all sorts of stuff, like quantum computation, but also we can probably detect them using neutrons or photons or, or by directly coupling them indirectly to, to phonons, for instance. And recently, so the question is, which materials do that? And recently, um, a material emerged that is called ruthenium trichloride that you can grow as relatively large single crystals. And it is believed that ruthenium trichloride realizes that Hamiltonian. And there have even been neutron scattering experiments on that material by the group at Oak Ridge, uh, colleagues of, of ours. And, and they found some scattering signal that is evocative of the presence of itinerant Majorana fermions in this material. However, the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, conferences are full of people arguing about this, so I will, not, you know, I will not tell you that this happened. We did not find the Kitayev quantum liquid, but we have ideas of simple materials that may realize this. And here you see ruthenium as one of the nice property. We can also use prosodium 4 plus, iridium 4 plus. There's, there's many materials candidates. So here we are in a regime where there's a beautiful theoretical ID and people are trying to find the materials that will realize that ID. And with neutron scattering, we can try to you know, 
be um, a little bit the police here and say, no, you don't have fractional excitations. You do have fractional excitations. You have an entangled ground state or you don't. But before we do this, we need large crystals. And if we don't get large crystals, we need to wait for the second target station in 2032 to do that. All right, I will, uh, uh, um, I'm uh, about uh, done here. Uh, so good, so this is pictures at this point. Of course, things are a bit more complicated and, and I'm happy to discuss and, and give some of the details. Um, but let me just uh, conclude here and talk a little, just very briefly about the future challenges. So the research we are doing and what I've presented here, in some sense, it works like this. We want to find quantum spin liquids and here at Georgia Tech, we have people in material science, chemistry, or in my lab, that make new materials. We can investigate them with spectroscopy, such as neutron spectroscopy or optics. And then we can couple this to theory. So right now in my lab, we are engaged in this feedback loop between making the materials, understanding the, the spectroscopy, understanding the theory, and, and trying to give feedback and, and discover new things. Ultimately, what this will produce is we will certify in this material we have fractional excitations. So what? What can we do from this? Okay, and why, why it did not happen yet? So one of the things that um, is emerging and that I feel is, is very important is that some of these phenomena are really best understood in real space and in the time domain. Exactly where scattering technique like mine is not adequate because you know, we are in momentum space and energy space. So we need to couple these discoveries with real space sensing of these materials. And I think that's a very large area that is emerging. And that's the example here of this NV center uh, qubit that is on the diamond at the uh, bottom of that AFM that can be used to sense the material and go and measure these excitations that are localized in the system. So that's one thing. So that's to help in the discovery. And the other thing is, once we have them, what can we do? Can we make devices? out of these materials that have these fractional excitations. One of the biggest challenge, all the materials I talked about are insulators. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna put some gates on it and you're gonna apply a difference of potential? It's not gonna do much, okay? Maybe you electrostatically will change a little bit the crystal field, but so one of the big challenge and what a lot of people are thinking about is how will we use the spin liquids in devices? So here, for example, this is from a paper of Jason Alicia at Caltech, where what you do is you create an interface between your spin liquid insulator and maybe a quantum hole state, and then you will be able to transfer the entangled nature of your exotic particles here to the quantum hole system that is metallic, and then to a gate, and then you will probably be able to interrogate and, 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 and do something to the system. But this is, this is a conceptual thing, okay? So wh what I see a huge challenge for the future is doing the translational research. How do we go from this physics discovery to something that may be integrated in a device, okay? Um, and people are thinking about a lot of exotic ideas. So of course you could use light to couple to the spin liquid. You can also use thermal transport. So although the system is electrically insulating, it is actually thermally conducting, and so you may use ideas of thermal transport to, 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 to interrogate this quantum system. But you know, we don't have this yet, so don't get too excited. The clean room will not suddenly get booked with ruthenium trichloride people, although in some places they are massively investing in functionalizing some of these materials, although it's not completely clear yet if they are fractional, if they are fractional excitations. So with this, uh, that's all I have, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. We have time for a few questions uh, here in the room. Hold on just a second. I'll bring the mic. Um, so when you talk about quantum spin liquids, right, and then could, would you consider the transition from a paramagnetic state to a QSL state as an actual phase transition? Because it's not necessarily breaking any symmetry, right? Would you still consider that as a phase transition? Yeah, so, so that, that's a, so no, uh, but that's a great question. So, um, so maybe I go back to the, to the very beginning. Um, yes, I had, a, I had a better cartoon in another, in another talk. So what's the difference between a liquid and a gas? Okay, 
So in a gas, the positions of the atoms are uncorrelated, mm -hmm. and in the liquid, they become correlated. Okay? So you may imagine the same happens in, in, a, sp in a spin system. So you have a, power, a, a, a traditional power magnet. The spins are, are fluctu fluctuating thermally, completely decorrelated. You cool the system. It becomes a classic, what I would call a classical spin liquid, the equivalent of this, mm -hmm. right? So the, the spin directions are correlated, still fluctuating, but non-entangled. And as I go to the lowest temperature, then there should be a transformation that is not a phase transition where there is coherence and entanglement that sets in. Most of the time, materials break a transition. There is a little bit something you've not considered in your Hamiltonian that actually breaks the symmetry right. in the system orders. So that's why it's so difficult to find them. Right. Okay. But one of the key questions in the theory of this is how do you go from classical to quantum? What are the phenomena that are taking place? Or do you send h bar to zero? And some of the things we are doing on FEA2 and the, the SUN magnets of this, this are going towards this, which is what happens when you, know, you, you thermally excite a magnet and, and how is the h bar, where is the h bar going? Where is the quantum mechanics going away? So, so this, is a, this is a very important question. I don't have an answer to this. This is actually one of the most important thing. How do you go from a quantum system to a classical system? How does coherence and entanglement vanish to be a product state at high temperature? And it will depend on, on, on the details, but, but this is exactly the, I mean, this, this is what we should be working on. Thanks, Martin. Are there any other? Oh. Uh, thank you very much for your good talk. Um, I'm curious, and I, I don't have the right words for this, but um, when you're looking at the um, 1D chain, mm -hmm. um, what, why doesn't the whole system switch? What keeps those kind of domain walls from propagating throughout the rest of the material? Uh, in the ferromagnetic case, okay, yeah. In the antiferromagnetic case. Oh, in the antiferro, they, they do propagate, right? But what okay. keeps the entire system from switching like, why does it... Um... Okay, so that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So, nothing prevents it. It's the cartoon that is wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I'm doing a cartoon here when I'm assuming that I have an anti-ferromagnetic state. But I'm also telling you it's a liquid, so it should not break. So, you should imagine that these spins are actually fluctuating in time. But locally, I'm making a snapshot of the system. And locally, it, it is anti-ferromagnetic. And locally, I create this thing. And these two domain walls... But then you're right that the, the, the overall direction and the overall thing vanishes at long times. So we should really imagine that this system is, is, is fluctuating. So this, is, this cartoon is wrong, but I have no choice. <laughs> okay, I have to give an idea of, of what is going on. In the ferromagnet, then there's no problem. This is a broken symmetry state, and everything behaves traditionally. Anything else? If not, let's thank Martin one more time for an excellent seminar.